What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Tech Guys Who Invest podcast. Uh, Adam and I started this podcast to do a couple things. We wanted to teach all of you how to invest wisely and safely. We wanted to bring on awesome professional investors to share knowledge with us and you as listeners. But we also wanted to use the podcast as a way of documenting our journey towards financial freedom. Because when we get out, we're going to be able to look back at these episodes and demonstrate, hey, we made it. And that's the fun aspect of it. With that being said, uh, we are going to do kind of a temperature check where we are on our journey, what's happening. Just a quick update we wanted to share with all of you uh, because we, we find that it's more fun to share where we're at and you can learn from our successes, failures, and experiences. Yeah, that's awesome. And this is going to be from the hip. You know, we haven't really prepared for this. We just were talking about it and thought this would be a really cool thing to do. So uh, you're going to get what we really feel and what we're thinking at this moment. Adam, do you want to start or do you want me to start? <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't you go, Kevin? All right, cool. So where I am uh, at right now, and to describe it, I think I'll use a, a picture. On my vision board, I, I haven't cut out the, the picture yet, but I keep visualizing a home plate and a batter at home plate. And for me, that symbolizes just swing. And what's going to happen? I can either hit a single, I can hit the ball, end up on base, I can hit the ball, it being a home run, or I can strike out. But there's such a hesitation on my end of the fear of failure and fear of losing somebody's money, especially a financial friend, if you will, that wants to invest with me and we do something together. There is that, that inherent fear of, uh-oh, so many things can go wrong, which I think can hold me back to a certain extent. Uh, and causes me to overthink the process. Think, what could go wrong? Have I planned for this? Oh man, but what about this detail? And you get to a point where there's so many details you are looking at where it's like, I, I, it prevents you from doing the very thing that you need to do. Yeah, analysis paralysis. Absolutely. And wow. I'm just talking to the right people. So this is why a team is so important. I've, uh, for example, Ohio, I'm looking at a note in Ohio and there's certain regulations depending on whether it's like a land contract, which is like a contract for deed or a, think of it, an analogy would be like a lease to own or it would be a traditional mortgage. If it's a traditional mortgage, my understanding is you have to have a certain certification and I Google that. And if I'm not entirely sure what I'm Googling, you kind of get lost, right? You don't know what you don't know. So that's why talking to the right people in your network, hey, have you heard of this? Who do you recommend me reaching out to? That's been huge, a referral. And then calling people, calling attorneys to understand if I have to foreclose, how much is it going to cost? How long is it going to take? What type of licensing do I need? Certifications do I need to make sure this happens? Because ultimately, what it, you don't want to do something and be in a, oh, crap moment. I forgot about that. So it's an interesting balance between having the the right amount of information to take action and making sure you don't screw up. Yeah, I I can completely relate. I know how you feel and that's the way I feel a lot when I'm doing something that's new to me, a new type of a deal or transaction for example. That yeah. is one of the things I like about what I'm focusing on right now, the large multifamily, um you can't do that alone, so I've got a team around me and I can lean on them for things I don't know. And I love, I love that. And what you said, I mean, you're, you're putting a team together, if you will, people who you can rely on. And that's just crucial, I think. And I absolutely. And that's why relationships matter so much. Going to networking events matter so much. Following up with these people, just saying, Hey, how's it going? Or share, share, you can share an article with somebody and say, what do you think about this? How do you think this can affect you? And it may not seem like a lot, but it's just, oh, this person's actively researching. That It shows some credibility. Um, ah, dang, I, I lost my train of thought. Yeah, that's all right, man. <laughs> I, I loved how you started this off with uh, your image of what you're doing on your vision board. I think that's really cool. I have the same thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my little um, tech guys who invest background off for those who are watching this on video. And uh, that way you can see my vision board here. That Amazing. The little stick figure that I just showed is he's got a, uh, a stick lever 
and he's moving a boulder from a flat, flat top aboard a hill, above a hill, towards the slope of the hill. And I've got a, a timeline in years. So 2019 is the little stick figure getting the boulder moving, rocking and rolling back and forth, and then pushing it forward. So it starts to roll on its own down the hill. And then in 2020, it's rolling on its own. In 2021, it's going really fast because this is a steep hill. 2022 and 23 and beyond, it rolls really fast on its own and it rolls on down. So I, it is really just profound to me how this vision is coming to fruition. Because when I drew that, that's what I wanted to happen. And I look at the board a lot and I, I try to envision that happening. And it is. I feel like I've got the boulder moving. I got my first deal, which is the hardest part to get the inertia. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And that's what I'm experiencing. At some point, you just have to swing and you have to accept the fact that what you're doing, what you're doing as an investor, there is inherent risk and you remove the risk by incorporating processes, getting the knowledge, having the right team in place. It's not my job to physically foreclose on a on a note if that performing note goes non-performing. That is what the team member is for. And like, it's not your job to physically change the light bulbs. That's what you have property management for. That's why you have contractors to do that stuff. The, a book I'm rereading right now, uh, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind by T. Harv Eker, mm -hmm. talks about how rich people take action before they have all the details. They're they're comfortable taking action and they're confident enough that they will make it work. Now that's, he's not saying take reckless risks. Um, right. He likes to say ready, fire, aim, <laughs> you know, do get ready, do prepare enough that, you know, it's the right decision, but then take action very quickly and just make it happen. You don't have to have all of the details. And I really like that. It helps me as well. You can't possibly know every single detail, right? But to, to have an idea of what to do next or know that you have a resource to call if something goes wrong, that's huge too. Yeah, I agree. A network has been really big for me. I, I've, I've come to, well, I've always valued that, but I've come to realize in this particular game just how important it is to have a network of people who are, like-minded, you know, very motivated to succeed. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree. Uh, so that's going on. What's going on for me in the note space is figuring out how to properly structure a deal that works for myself and the investor. Um, just continuously analyzing, continuously trying to find more and more notes. So, Hey, if you've got a, a note that you want to sell, let us know tech guys who invest at gmail.com. I would love to take a look at it. Uh, but that's what I've been up to. What have you been up to since closing on your 59? Uh, since closing on the 59, I was involved in another deal, uh, which was an 88 unit in Tallahassee. And that was, um, we were under contract. We were in due diligence and I was working very hard toward my second deal. And uh, it it actually came apart. We ended up backing out of the deal in due diligence. And, um, that was a mix. It was, a, it was mixed emotions. It was obviously disappointing because I was really looking forward to doing my second deal. I'd learned so much on that journey already, um, on that project. But, um, at the same time, I wasn't crushed because I felt like I learned and I grew from the experience and I'm able to apply that to opportunities going forward. Um, so I have another opportunity right now that's in the hopper. I can't really say too much about it at this moment, but it does look like I will have, um, another multifamily opportunity coming soon. <laughs> so what I'm doing right now is preparing. Uh, I'm talking to people who have expressed interest in investing with me in the next opportunity I've got. So I'm, uh, talking to those people and getting them ready to uh, to look at the details of this opportunity once I can share it. Sure. Uh, and, and really pushing forward. One of my goals is to get another uh, equivalent 
least size deal done before 2019. So, you know, by the time 2019 is over with, I want to have more than 100 units under my belt. So I'm pushing really hard for that right now. Awesome. That is huge. So you took that loss, or if you want to call it a loss, and you said, okay, you accepted it, you felt it, and you said, all right, let's just move on to the next one. That's an important trait. Instead of like, oh man, we lost this one. My entire career is over. You shifted the mentality to to really look at what can I do next and prepare for the next one. Yeah, that's right. That that is uh thanks for pointing that out because that I hadn't really looked at it that way or sort of reflected on it that way for myself. But you're right. I think in the past I may have dwelled on it a little more negatively than I do now. And you and I, are, I think, are the same in that if it's more so I have a bad tendency of looking what didn't get done as opposed to, wow, look at all the things that I've gotten done. Yeah, it's a good point. That's cool because that shows growth in myself, you know, and you don't always see it in yourself. So when someone else kind of helps you see that, as that's pretty cool. I appreciate that. Yeah, ex- that I told, awesome, of course, man. man. Of course, I'm going to point that out. So I love it. Can you talk about what happened? Why in the due diligence what was the big red flag or multiple red flags that said we we need to back out? Is that something you can share? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't see any reason why I couldn't. So it was a it, it was a complicated deal to begin with. In fact, you know, I've I've got a bit of a theory that in this market to find a deal, you have to see something others aren't because of the straightforward deals that go on the market and you see brokers list are getting top dollar. They're getting asking price in most cases. And um, if you want to have a deal, if you want to get a deal, you need to make it. So this was a complicated deal. We saw something that others didn't. And it, it was um, a property that consisted of condominiums that we were going to convert to apartments. Now they were apartments when they were originally built, but sometime in the last couple of decades, investors came in and converted them to condos and sold them off, made money that way. Now they're being converted back. (laughs) Life (laughs) Um, comes full circle apparently. (laughs) It's really interesting, right? So the play for us was to get enough of them to be able to take over the HOA And that way we didn't have to worry about the HOA and um, take them over as apartments and then buy the rest of them over our hold period. Uh, And they're investor owned. The whole complex is investor owned, but but they're not all the same investors. Most investors only own one unit or maybe two. Those are really difficult for investors. hard to sell those kind of condos. So if we were offering to buy a package and allow people to sell their as part of the package, they would jump at the chance to offload that thing. We would get a good deal on it and everybody's happy. Everybody wins in that situation. And then what it would allow us to do is reposition the property as a large apartment complex, fully rented, well-managed and sell it to a very large operation like a, a REIT or one of those big players. Um, that was the long-term play. But these transactions where you're buying condos and converting them to apartments are a bit complicated. They're not well known by a lot of people. They make some people nervous. And we well, struggle to raise them capital. Because of the legal ramifications of the HOA, uh, I think that is the primary reason it makes people nervous. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah, just, and a lot, I don't know, they, they've they got a kind of a bad rap for some reason. So Going from condo to apartment? Going from condo to apartment, yeah. Interesting. I, I'm pretty sure most of it is from the legality of the HOA. And even though we were going to be taking over the HOA, um, you know, and perhaps there's something about the common areas as well Mm -hmm. that that make people nervous. I'm not sure. Or perhaps it's all of the different owners of the existing condos. But, um, but I do know that um, there were some people who would have been great passive investors, you know, limited partners and, um, their their 
experienced accredited type investors looking at investing pretty large sums of money with us and their their legal team was saying now nah, let's let's look for something that isn't that that condo type deal that has similar returns and see if we can just find that it'll it'll be less risk for you and so you know they're going to take their lawyers advice as they should and um and so for that reason we just kind of struggled to raise capital okay so it was the it was the lawyer who and this is why you pay lawyers and have them on your team that said my analysis of this is showing some type of a red flag or a hiccup that a snag that could cost you greatly and at that point i'm assuming the main partners just made an executive decision to say we're going to back out because it doesn't make sense or how did that work yeah it's pretty much that actually we we had a meeting and we we talked through it and and discussed it and it, it was very similar to what you just described okay yeah well that's good i mean you do have to listen to the lawyers that's important right that's absolutely what they're there yeah. for we we um don't you know we don't have any ill feelings against the people who who did that uh and it expressed interest but then backed out because of their their legal counsel's advice in fact I mean, we want them to follow their legal counsel, you know? Yeah, we, absolutely. Um, so yeah, we're totally fine with that. It's, it's business, right? And, um, and we learn from that as well. You know, we won't go after one of those type of deals again because it was a lot of hard work. I mean, we all still really believe in our business plan. And to this day, I, I think it was a fantastic deal with tons of opportunity. But um, because of all of the time and effort we put in, it was just a lot of lost, you know, a lot of lost work there that, that didn't pay off in the end. Sure. And so we wouldn't go after another type, one of those deals. Hey, you live and learn. And I think that is what we're doing constantly, right? Yeah, oh, okay. Absolutely. It's like getting rejected a bunch of times. Okay. This didn't work. Let me try something else. Or let me go talk to somebody else. And eventually those no's turn into a yes. Yeah. But the next one we're looking at um, with, you know, with the same team that we did the 59 with, we're, we're looking at another more straightforward multifamily unit in the Tampa Bay area. And I, I like being in this area as well. You know, there's something nice about an area that I, that I know really well. Like your backyard, um, basically. Yeah, exactly. Although I think Tallahassee is a good place to invest. I mean, a lot of the articles I was reading when we were doing research on that city for the, for this other deal, um, indicate that it, it is a, a growing, attractive area, good place to have a multifamily asset. So walk us through when you say it's from the articles you've read, it seems like a good place. As in, uh, you've been doing the research, you've been putting a lot of hard work, so you're seeing something a bit differently. How would you describe to our listeners what it is you're looking for in those articles? Yeah, I'm looking for signs. Uh, you know, I could boil it down to a simple thing and just say I'm looking for signs that people would want to live in the type of property we will own and manage there. <laughs> so, there you, you know, the uh, type of people who would live in an apartment are there and want to be there and are, you know, that, that base is growing. So things mm -hmm. you're looking for are job growth. Um, you're looking for population growth and you're looking to make sure the the asset is in a good location. So if you've, you've got those things and then you're looking at demographics that tell you, um, it's likely that the type of people who would want to live in whatever asset it is you're, you're acquiring would want to live there and it's growing, that's likely to continue into the future. Those are great indicators. Okay. That's awesome. And that makes <laughs> sense, right? You need to make sure you can put bodies in the apartment units. You wouldn't, it's like uh, those companies that were too ahead of their time. They create a product that retrospectively, wow, that was pioneering but at the time nobody was ready to use it so you want to make sure that the market research shows that um if we do this are we going to be able to make money exactly yeah and making sure the demographics match the type of tenant you expect to live there so you know it's um pretty common sense actually there you go <laughs> it is pretty i mean yes it is. and no yeah I think it's common sense when you've built up more of a, an understanding of what to look for. Um, but yeah. Yeah. It's a good point. That just shows that we've made a lot of progress. 
<laughs> yeah, it's kind of neat to to do this every now and then to stop and and kind of take a look at where we are and to share that with our listeners. Um, hopefully, if they've been listening along the way, they see it somehow in some way. And actually, if you do, it would be really cool to me and Kevin if you send us a note and let us know some things you may have noticed or something you've seen. I think that would be pretty awesome. It's kind of like a social experiment almost, right? <laughs> <laughs> On ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a good point. Because <laughs> you don't really notice it within yourself. It's right. harder to at least. Yeah. But it would be really cool to hear that from, from some others. I agree. I agree 100%.